Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We have now resumed in-person worship with one service at 10 a.m., which is live streamed both on Facebook and on YouTube. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music. You may confirm worship times and receive more information by visiting our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our scripture comes from the 11th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah has been prophesying to the remnant of Israel following the destruction of the northern kingdom about a coming king and the peaceful kingdom of his reign. Jesse, referred to in the first line, is King David's father. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. A shoot shall come out from the stock of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the, lep the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Their nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. On that day the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In Plato's Republic, Plato's brother Glaucon tells the story that's known as the Ring of Gyges. This ring has magic properties so that the person who puts it on be can become invisible, essentially allowing them to do whatever they want. The person, the shepherd who finds the, the ring in the Republic, uses it to uh, become invisible and meet the queen and seduce her and plot together to kill the king so that the shepherd can then take over the kingdom. It is the argument of Glaucon that with this ring... That without fear of negative repercussions, of never being caught and doing anything illegal or immoral or whatever it might be, that even the best person would never live a life of justice. That the freedom that this power brings and the power that this ring brings would lead everyone to think of their own desires and wants to the exclusion and destruction of everyone else. So Glaucon argues that if there's anything that would prove that we are ultimately self-centered people, that ultimately we don't care about what people think of us and we don't really care about others, this ring of Gyges would prove that. And I was in a political philosophy class as an undergrad and we had read this portion of the Republic. I'd read the Republic several times before this. And the professor said, what would you do if you got this ring? And I can remember I said that I would travel the world, right? You could sneak onto airplanes and go wherever you wanted to be. That seems like a pretty good use of that ring. I don't remember what anybody else in the class said except for this one young woman. And she said that she wouldn't take the ring because she didn't want to have to deal with the responsibility or power that came with it. And what I remember was not only was that answer so different because he said, what are you going to do with the ring? I didn't even think not taking the ring was an option, right? I was following the, the professor's instructions. But also just that sense of, 
her claiming, I don't want the responsibility of having to deal with the repercussions that come from this. I don't want to have to deal with the ultimate freedom that this ring opens for me. The power to do whatever it is that I want. Ultimate freedom. And so it's with that idea that we move on then in our series looking at the gifts we receive because of Christ. Last week we looked at the gift of reconciliation and today we look at the gift of freedom. So what does it mean to say that we have been freed in Christ? What does that freedom look like? And how do we understand that freedom? Now, our typical definition of freedom, at least in English, is the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraints. Right? We hear that a lot these days in people talking about their rights. I have the right to do this, and if you're saying I don't, then you're a tyrant. Right? You're trying to tell me what to do and what to think, and you, you don't have that power over me because I have freedom. And so if someone's right to restrict it is tyranny, that means that ultimately then they're enslaved. But is that what Scripture says? Is that what Paul and Peter in particular in the New Testament mean? That when they say that we have been freed in Christ, that we are therefore freed to do whatever it is that we want to do, the world and other people be damned? Clearly there were some actually in the early church who thought that, and there's still some who exist in the church today who want to believe what's no technically known as antinomianism. That is rejection of the law. That if we have been freed from the law as it given, was given to the Israelites because of the grace of God given to us through Christ, then that, doesn't that mean that we are then freed from all restrictions? That there is nothing controlling or containing us. After all, if we, if we do something wrong, all we have to do is ask God to forgive us, right? So we should be able to go out and do whatever we want, ask God to forgive, and go out and do whatever we want again. That's how it has to work, right? That we've been freed in Christ, and we've been forgiven for anything we do wrong. So clearly we can do whatever we want. We see Paul dealing with this very issue in his first letter to the Corinthians. And they say to him, all things are lawful. And Paul responds, but not all things are beneficial. And not all things build up. And so it's clear that these arguments around freedom have gone on for a very long time. And these arguments that we are free to just do whatever we want, Paul wants to say, are very wrong. Because while we've been freed from the law, while we've been freed in Christ, it's not a freedom for self-indulgence. But to a better understanding, we've been freed from our slavery to sin and death. That's the ultimate freedom found in Christ, Paul argues. Now, does that mean that if we've been freed, that sin and death no longer exist? No, because we know that they are still there but that they no longer control us. They no longer have power over us. They no longer have the last word in our lives. That in our freedom from Christ, we don't get to do whatever we want to do because of Christ, but instead we have the freedom to join with Christ, to yoke ourselves to Christ, as we heard in a gospel passage a few weeks ago. And that means working with Christ, alongside of Christ, and in the direction that God, Christ guides us. It says that we are going to follow Christ, or to put it more blatantly as the scriptures put it, we are going to come, become slaves to Christ. Doesn't sound much like freedom, does it? But the best example of this we find is an identity story. Because Mary has this announcement that she's going to become pregnant, not that she already is which says to me that she has a choice in this matter. What is she going to do? Is she going to reject what God is giving her? Or is she going to say, as she does, here I am a servant of the Lord. That Greek could be translated slave as well. That we are going to profess our faith in Christ, and Christ will become our king. 
And if you have a king, then you have a kingdom. And what does kingdom have? Rules that you follow that the king has laid down. This is how you're going to live your life. So we don't get to say that Christ is king and then say, and I'm going to do whatever it is that I want. That's not how freedom in Christ works. And said, the freedom is us willingly pledging our allegiance to Christ as king. So that, as we heard several times when he looked at the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul says in Galatians, it is that we die to our old selves, and it is not we who live, but it is Christ Jesus who lives in us. That we have subordinated ourselves to the will of Christ. And it's not forced upon us because the freedom is given to us for us to freely choose. So we've been freed from slavery to sin and death. And that doesn't mean that we won't make mistakes, that we no longer sin, but that we are no longer slaves to sin, because as Paul says, the wages of sin are death. So when you're a slave to sin, it leads to death. But under freedom in Christ leads to eternal life because of God's grace and mercy and forgive us, free us from the penalty of sin. That's what Paul says in his letter to the Romans, that being freed from sin, we then enslave ourselves to God. And the advantage of being a servant to God, he says, is eternal life. Because when we are slaves to sin and death, they become our masters. And they have the final word. But when we free ourselves in Christ from the slavery to sin and death, God has the final word. That God can overcome the worst mistake we ever make in our lives. That God says to us, you are so much more than the worst thing you have ever done. And I love you. And I want to spend eternity with you. So again, freedom is not a means of self-indulgence, but the path to righteousness. That yoke that we take on with Christ. And then we seek the advantage not of ourselves, but we seek then the advantage of others. That doesn't sound anything like the freedom we talk about in secular culture. And so this freedom in Christ, just as it was when it was originally proclaimed when Christ was alive, is countercultural today, just as it was then. Because this freedom calls us not to self-indulgence, it calls us to sacrificial love, just as Christ did. It calls us to something deeper and something more for us to turn our lives over to God freely, not under compulsion, but to freely seek the will of God and to follow God in our lives, not for our own, but for the world's good. That Jesus frees us to be co-creators with God in the world. And so we should hear that passage then that we heard from Isaiah again. The passage known as, known as the peaceable kingdom. And last week we heard Isaiah in chapter 2 talking about the nations coming to God in order to, to learn from God and to learn to walk in God's ways. And when we began to do that, the nations would no longer um, learn war. They would turn their swords into plowshares. And today we get an even greater vision of that, except it tells of the coming of the one who will bring ultimate peace. Someone from the line of David upon the, whom the spirit will rest, giving him wisdom and understanding, counsel and knowledge to lead people to God. And so this vision is, is that of the coming of the king, the Messiah, the prince of peace. And as I already said, if you're going to be in a kingdom under a king, then there are rules that we have to follow. And that guidance that the king establishes. Because then when we do that, then we get this vision of peace. Isaiah says, the, the wolf shall live with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. Now that vision, the, the wolf and the lion laying down with the animals they normally want to eat, is that freedom for them? Are they doing whatever it is that they want? No, they're not even doing what's natural to them. 
Instead, this peaceable kingdom, we could get move on to that idea of gentleness, which is power under control. They are being set free from their natural desires to become slaves to God. And so it is with us. For once we were sins to slave, once we were slaves to sin and death, but Christ has set us free. Not free for self-indulgence, as Paul says in Galatians, but so that we can learn to love the Lord our God and to seek God's righteousness first, and then learn to love our neighbor as ourselves. To become servants to the world, following the lights of Christ into the world. Seeking to overcome the darkness in the world through the power of the Spirit because Christ is living in us. It is not we who lives, but it is Christ Jesus who lives in us. Not because we have to do it, but because we get to do it. That is the freedom to freely choose to follow Christ or not. To freely take on this role, to freely accept the gift of Christ given to the world, to freely accept that gift of reconciliation, to come into a deeper relationship, not with, just with God, but with each other, and to accept the freedom that Christ has given to us and freeing us from the slavery to sin and death. The freedom to willingly and cheerfully take up our cross and to follow, to allow Christ to abide in us as we abide in Christ, and to learn from him, to yoke ourselves to him, to work alongside him in order to bring forth the kingdom of God, to bring forth these visions that we receive from Isaiah of the peaceable kingdom, of what it looks like when we work together doing God's will in the world, walking that path of righteousness that God has set before us when we learn to live together in hope and peace and joy and love. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And remember that every action you take today could change someone's life. So make sure it's a good one, and be an agent of love. God bless.